whales. Cool, aren't they? They include the largest animals that have ever existed. They are majestic, fantastic, silly and alien. Without any kind of context on its taxonomic position, one would think whales are fish. But I think it's pretty obvious by now, even for the general public, that they are actually mammals. But I don't think many stop to think how completely odd whales are. Like, I mean, they are mammals, but what kind of mammals are they? How did they got here? What sort of crazy evolutionary processes occur to force us to coexist with these floating aquatic blubber balls that are certainly not brainless? Here we are going to take a look at how and why whales evolved, and how we are going to see whales in ways that are a bit more weird than you thought you would. So, before we start talking about how did whales went to existence, I think it is safe to just take our bets on what exactly are the closest living relative of whales. We currently do have a very clear picture of who are their closest relatives, but if you don't have any clue, I would expect you to just take some other marine mammals as possible relatives. Seals, sea lions, walruses, sea otters, manatees and dugongs are the other marine mammals that exist in our world, but phylogenetic and molecular analysis show us another relationship, a much more terrestrial relationship. Don't worry, I am not suggesting whales are related to completely odd terrestrial animals like weasels or raccoons or elephants or tenrex. Seemingly the closest living relatives of whales are hippos. It might seem odd as hippos are not marine mammals, though they are aquatic and share several other features with them. One interesting feature that I deem important is their method of reproduction, which as we will explore further will play a very important role on why did whales evolve the ways they did while most other mammals stayed behind. Hippos are ungulates, or hoofed animals. Although initially treated in their own order, Cetacea, whales seemingly are inserted in a much more odd group, the even-toed ungulates. Get the pun? The even-toed ungulates, or Archaeodactyls, is a group traditionally characterized for usually having an even number of toes, usually two or four. Odd-toed ungulates, like horses, rhinos and tapirs, have an odd number of toes, one or three toes. Though that is obviously not the reason why whales are inserted in the even-toed ungulate group, as they, well, they have no toes. Even-toed ungulates include a large variety of hoofed animals like camels, pigs, cows, sheep, deer, giraffes and hippos. All the modern hoofed animals, it would make sense for whales to be related to hippos because of their aquatic lifestyle, but the actual similarities go even further than that. As I was saying, the reproduction. Ungulates have precocial babies. That means babies are born fully capable of walking and running few hours after birth. Why is this important for whales if they, you know, don't walk or run? Well, the opposite of precociality is altruciality. Altruciality means that, when you are born, you are helpless. A large majority of mammals is altricial at birth and is only capable of following their mother out of their den after at least some days after birth. If you have a dog or a cat that had babies, you understand what I'm talking about. Heck, humans are altricial too. So why is it important? Well, it's important because whales can't go on land, and if your babies are helpless and can't follow you in a vast ocean, well, you are dead. Whales are born fully capable of swimming on their own, and despite that being a common characteristic that these marine mammals have with, for instance, the manatees and dugongs, it's not something other marine mammals like seals, sea lions, walruses and sea otters do. Seal babies are not born with the layer of fat that their parents have and may die if they decide to go to the frigid water too early. This prevents seals and their relatives from becoming completely aquatic like whales. They have to be able to go on land to raise their young. Seals are still impressive animals though, and some, like the elephant seal, have reached to extraordinary limits to get huge while still being able to crawl their fat ass onto land. Sea otters are unique, as their young are altricial, but they float around the kelp coasts and never go to land. The sea otter's baby has its eyes fully open upon birth and is filled with baby fur that retains so much air on it that the baby floats like a cork, completely incapable of diving under the water until it develops the adult-like fur. As we can see, the ways the young are born and develop after birth will dictate how a marine mammal is capable of showing off its efficiency and end up dictating its evolution. Another curious factor also related to reproduction is a much more uncomfortable fact, but it actually dictates several key aspects on mammal evolution. 
and that is the way testicles are positioned. Well, while seals and sea otters have a scrotum like we do, whales, manatees and dugongs do not. Although manatees and dugongs lacking a scrotum make sense in evolutionary arguments, as they belong to an entire clade of mammals that lacks them, whales seem to stray from that, at least at first glance. Whales are part of a very large clade of mammals known as scrotifera, which literally translates to beast with scrotum. Although scrotum is a characteristic that is common among several species of mammals, including us, obviously, this seems to be a defining characteristic to determine this clade. Scrotifera include every group of Laurasiaceae mammals that possess scrotum, including bats, pangolins, carnivorans, including seals and sea otters, and hoofed animals, including whales. The scrotum is actually a characteristic basal in mammals. It exists in marsupials, but it seems to have re-evolved in placental mammals, and later was lost in several lineages. The lineage that includes we humans, our closest relatives, and then the Laurasiaceae, basally add a scrotum. In Laurasius ears, the Olipotiflans, including shrews, moles, and hedgehogs, lost these, while every other Laurasius ear belongs to the Scrotifera clade. And because I'm not gonna be posting images of mammalian scrotum for you, I'll just say that whales are well inserted in a group well known for having testicles poking out of their body. Although it might seem like a poor evolutionary strategy, the reason why many mammals have scrotum is to keep the testicles at a low body temperature. And because many mammals have a high body temperature in relation to other mammals, it's best to keep them outside to cool down. Manatees are part of the Afrosphere clade, a group of mammals that, unlike Laurasiaceae, don't have the same advanced capabilities that allow them to have a proper control of their own internal body temperature. And because of that, their temperature is not necessarily high enough to prevent a family allowance from being safely protected in their insides. Whales, however, have internal testicles because the water is simply, well, too damn cold for them. And if you're a man, you understand how that's not properly pleasant. Interestingly, hippos have the ability of retracting their testicles voluntarily, so maybe that's a precedent to how whales decided to keep their male reproductive organs protected, and it actually helps in maintaining streamlining while swimming gracefully in the water. Hey, uh, sorry to interrupt, but are you okay? What is it, Gary? Nothing, it's that I think I heard you say the word scrotum and it felt weird. I'm fine, thanks for asking. It's okay. It's that it felt weird, that's all. I mean, it's just a word, like... Exactly, it's just a word. It's totally okay. Go take a walk, Gary. So, as I was saying, whales share more similarities with hippos apart from all the reproduction-related shenanigans. For instance, they share similar levels of airy integument. Hippos are generally naked, but have extensive vibrissae in their snouts. Although you might not think whales have these, well, they do. Baleen whales have vibrissae in their snouts, against what you may have thought. Tusset whales, like dolphins, lose this before or shortly after birth, leaving instead vibrissal crypts in some species. Whales are also capable of making underwater calls and songs, and interestingly that is also observed at some degree in hippos. One might bring up the question why did whales descend from a clade mostly known for including herbivorous animals, when no cetacean eats plants? Well, the reason for that is that ungulates are actually not fully herbivorous, at least not most species. Unlike the super herbivorous manatees and their terrestrial relatives, the elephants, many ungulates retain canines. Although mostly used to scythe the plants they feed on, they are also used for combat and even inflict wounds on the flesh of rivals, and sometimes even prey. Hippos, despite being herbivorous, have been observed in occasion eating meat, and we all know pigs are omnivorous. In the sea, it is complicated to be an herbivore, with a limited amount of vegetation, and that is also one of the many reasons why whales have been more successful at oceanic domination than manatees and dugongs, stuck to an herbivorous lifestyle. However, whales do share yet another characteristic with hoofed animals, in terms of their digestive system. Just like many ungulates, whales have multiple stomachs. I mean, as fascinating whales are, they still look completely alien. Is it that much more illustrative if we just step back and went to the past to just take a look at how and when whales started? Maybe that's what we are going to do. So let's open our magic metaphorical window to the past. Okay, so we are gonna make a stop at the early Eocene of India, not just to explain stuff about the evolution of whales, but really just because I need to do something there. Wait a second here. <laughs> Sorry, but 
time travel really turned me around. So um, let's start here. So the common ancestor between hippos and whales was surprisingly not an herbivorous animal, it was an omnivorous one, one could even say carnivorous. This is Indoheos, a small terrestrial animal that lived 50 million years ago. India was starting to collide against Asia, and the shallow seas that it was making between them were authentic pools for the cetacean ancestors to just try and experiment their swimming abilities while still in their infancy. It is believed the first hoofed animal was actually an omnivore or a carnivore with precocial young. The reason why they evolved precociality may have been due to their necessity of having young that are fully capable of escaping predators as soon as they are born. The characteristic was seemingly maintained with lineages of younglets that became carnivorous, such as the cetaceans, who should have no big deal in becoming carnivorous in the ocean. On land, however, younglets largely survived as they evolved into several herbivorous lineages, as that would likely be more appropriate for their ball plan, which later led the way for the evolution of modern carnivorans, which have altricial babies because they have no problem in having babies being hunted down, especially when you are the only hunter around. So let's take a look at Indoheos then. Indoheos was actually a small animal, around the size of your cutie cat you have on your home. Although it seems to be just a kind of thing you would see in a weird primitive jungle, there are indications that the long-legged animal showed adaptations for swimming and even submerge underwater. This may not sound that radical when you compare this to modern chevrotains, the smallest hoofed mammals in the world today. These small ruminants, when threatened by a predator, may swim and dive underwater for up to 4 minutes and stay there until the threat disappears. Solid indication these guys were being hunted, and in fact, maybe water was their sacred refuge. Whales really are the ultimate product of flushing your problems away. Now we jump to 49 million years ago in Pakistan, and now we can take a look at Mr. Pakicetus. I like this guy, very polite, except when giving a bite. This guy is interesting because it shows us that before they wanted to go whale, they wanted to go croc. This guy was perfectly built to walk and run on land, but had clear adaptations for water dwelling. Eyes positioned at the top of the head, similar to how crocodiles have them, to observe any possible meals outside of the surface of the water. Even its bones were dense and heavy to help this boy submerge. Either way, the Pachycetus would likely not be swimming very far, and it would stick in fresh water. It likely wandered around the moist beaches in search of something tasty to feast on. And yet again, Pakistan shows itself as the cradle of whales. As we move to 48 million years ago, we see a new creature evolved, the Ambulocetus. Weird name, but it actually makes sense. Ambulocetus literally means walking whale, fitting name since you know it has legs. Interestingly though, this early whale may not have been able to walk much. I mean, it likely could, but its limbs were poorly perfected for that task, and there doesn't seem to be much of a reason for them to go on land, when plenty of food exists in the water. This is a proper crocodile-like mammal, it even involved extensive mandibular foramen to ear better underwater. It swam by using its back legs to propel itself while maintaining an undulating motion, not too different from how otters swim underwater. They were also the first to start leaving freshwater regions. Fossils from Ambulocetus have been shown through oxygen isotope analysis that different individuals from the genus and different hunting ground preferences, with some preferring fresh water while others preferring salt water, while most took advantage of the diversity of both watery worlds. This is a clear transition between whales' freshwater ancestors to the more marine dwellers of today. Now we move to 45 million years ago, in India again where aquatic lifestyles went even greater. Meet Remingtonocetus. These guys were, well, long. They belonged to the Remingtonocetidae, that included several other related animals, including the possibly weirder Cuchicetus. Remingtonocetids were exclusive marine mammals as evidenced by oxygen isotope analysis. Elongated marine hunters they were, fishing in the shallow waters, estuaries and lagoons of southern Asia. They have evolved one critical characteristic that might have changed everything in cetacean evolution. The semicircular canals in their ears were reduced. How did such a small change make that big of a difference? 
Well, the semicircular canals are very important for balancing in land mammals. If you are not aware, we have some structures in our ear that inform us that we are unbalanced. This makes sense in a world where you need to stick to the ground so to not fall. In the water this makes no sense, as you do not fall, and especially for an animal that never came back to land unless to give birth to young, just like the Remington ascetics. By reducing these, that was a clear demonstration by the gods of evolution that you shall never return to land again, and you are now free to evolve and conquer the oceans. This is unprecedented in mammalian history, and only until Sirenians evolved, these were the only completely aquatic mammals that ever existed in history. 43 million years ago, we go to Egypt and we find Protocetus. I believe you guys need a little bit of context. In the Eocene there was basically a large shallow sea between Africa, India, Asia and Europe, the perfect cradle for new aquatic mammals to evolve. By this time, being completely destined for a fully aquatic lifestyle, cetaceans are now prepared for a future of greatness. The Protocetidae family was amphibious. Despite all of their adaptations for watery locomotion, there were clear features that they still had to develop. There were various species of protocetids, some were fully marine and aquatic, while others had to go out to land yet. One clear factor, attached to their reproduction, was how the babies would come out of their mother's wombs. As we know, whales are air breathers, for they have lungs, like any mammal. Therefore, during underwater births, modern whales give birth to their young tail first, to avoid them drowning. However, from direct fossil evidence we have signs that Protocetus actually gave birth to their young heads first. This implies that they needed to give birth on land. Some Protocetus still had some abilities that allowed them to support their weight on land, though they were likely walking around like seals do, clumsy on land. Some even retained hoofs, solidifying their younglet ancestry. And now we jump to 40 million years ago. Now, well, anywhere. Cetaceans have now evolved to become fully aquatic and are now true whales. The modern group of whales is still not around, but we now have mammals that do not require to give birth at first and go on land so that their babies can breathe. We now have fully aquatic beasts swimming in the oceans of the entire world. Two families existed, although with taxonomical disputes being thrown around the Basilosaurids and the Dorodontids. The Basilosaurids were the largest aquatic mammals around. Basilosaurus was an authentic elongated monster that reached up to 18 meters long, filled with sharp teeth at the front to puncture flesh and huge crushing ones at the back to grind bone and sinew. You do not want to meet this guy. The Dorodontids, like the Dorodon, were smaller and had a body plan more akin to modern whales. These ancient whales had tail flukes, though the Basilosaurids used the tail ondulation to wander around, with the tail fluke not taking a role on propulsion, though Dorodontids had a locomotion very similar to modern whales. Both had their nostrils located at the top of their head, in a similar position to modern whales' blowholes. They did not add a melon organ, so they did not practice underwater echolocation, and they also had a relatively small brain, so they were likely not social which would make this whale world pretty solitary, if not menacing, to witness. Additionally, they also had reduced back legs. These were completely useless for locomotion, but may have been repurposed as mating claspers. The reason why the back limbs were reduced in size is to allow more muscular freedom to help the tail to move freely and help to move underwater. Fortunately, most of these dumb, bloodthirsty early whales went extinct at the end of the Eocene, due to the climatic changes that reaped several unique clays from the ocean. Fortunately, this was not before the modern whales arrived. Modern whales are divided into two modern groups, the Mysticete and the Odontocete whales. Mysticete whales, or baleen whales, are the group that includes toothless whales that instead have what is called the baleen, air-like filaments in their mouths to help them filter feed their favorite food, like plantain, krill and small fish. These include the largest animals ever. The odontocete whales include whales that have teeth. These are much more diverse, including oceanic dolphins, porpoises, belugas, narwhals, river dolphins, beaked whales and sperm whales, or if you have a problem with that, cachalots. These two have varied differences and are believed to have split from each other in the late Eocene, and by that time they have already lost their back legs altogether. 
Interestingly, the Misty Seed whale evolution is somewhat well documented. We know from fossils that the first whales of the Misty Seed lineage had teeth. Eventually, various evolutionary processes allowed for the generation of the baleen and the subsequent loss of teeth. Baleen is a weird keratinous compound, strings coming out of the whale's mouth. Its origin actually seems to come from skin rugosities that eventually became string-like. These are obviously used to filter their favorite food. Baleen whales seem to have diversified the most, as well as becoming huge. During the Middle Miocene, some 15 million years ago, as the Ice Ages started arriving and conditions started to rise for their preferred food sources. Filter feeding is very beneficial for the energetic requirements for such huge sizes, and that's what allowed whales to become the largest animals to have ever existed, even larger than any dinosaur. Odontocetes, or toothed whales, are much more diverse. They've evolved acute echolocation abilities as evidenced by their melon organ. They use sonar and emit clicks that reflect in objects and are then detected by the lower jaw. This allowed these whales to find food in different regions, such as in the depths, in the murky rivers and in the shallow oceans. The ancient diversity of odontocetes is also amazing. One can point out how alien the modern narwhal looks, and not gonna lie, it does look odd, but creatures like the semirostrum with its shovel-like lower jaw, the odobanocetops, the wannabe walrus stand out as prehistoric oddities. Back in the Miocene Epoch, whales were also far more menacing and dangerous. Sperm whales are the largest modern toothed whales, and despite looking like monstrosities, they actually prefer feeding on giant squids, rather than killing other mammals, so unless you really annoy one, you likely won't be voluntarily attacked by one. However, the past was a cradle for a unique clade of killer sperm whales. As if the actual killer whales weren't enough, which to be fair, might have diversified after the extinction of the killer sperm whales. Killer sperm whales included several species, but the largest might have been the Leviathan. The name says it all. It was the most formidable marine predator at the time, and might even have been hunting the mighty megalodon shark. Eventually, whales started to increase their brain size. Dolphins are now the most intelligent, non-human animals on Earth. That is until they decide to leave Earth altogether. So, as you can see, whales are truly fantastic and unique creatures. But while whales existed and evolved, one question could still stand. Why are whales so unique? Why didn't this happen with another group of mammals? Why didn't this happen before? One must take into account the arrival of whales indicated that a lot of stuff had to be happening at the same time. Mammals have explored aquatic lifestyles countless times, but becoming fully aquatic and marine is yet another big challenge. Only two clades of mammals are known to have become fully incapable of leaving the water and walk on land, whales and the Sirenians, aka manatees and dugongs. Why didn't other mammals did it, and why didn't they did before? Mammals have existed since the age of the dinosaurs. It is presumed they originated in the late Triassic some 225 million years ago. At that time, they were small and dwarfed by the giant dinosaurs. They were very diverse at the time, and some aquatic forms are even presumed to have existed back then. However, they never became fully aquatic. Even reptiles went fully marine several times. Mosasaurs, for instance, started as simple serpentine like lizards, also dwarfed by dinosaurs and many other creatures. Not at all relevant and eventually they went to the sea, and after a little bit of luck, they rose to become the apex predators of their oceans of the late Cretaceous, before their extinction when the asteroid hit the Earth and ended their reign 66 million years ago. So why did mammals never got there back then, if they were even more diverse than Mosasaur's terrestrial ancestors? As I've said before, reproduction is actually key. Most mammals today are viviparous, that means they give birth to their own young. The basal most mammals are the monotremes, like the platypus, which lay eggs. Egg-laying mammals, like reptiles, can't lay their eggs in the water, otherwise water will power inside the porous eggshells and drown the young in development inside the egg. So they have to go to land to lay eggs. Marine reptiles nowadays that lay eggs need to go on land to lay them. Many marine scaly creatures that exist in our Earth's past, like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, were viviparous, so they abandoned their ability to lay eggs and now give birth to their young. The young were born and were perfectly able to of swimming to the surface to breathe if required. However, not all mammals are born fully active. 
even without being part of the egg-laying group. Marsupials, for instance, give birth to very underdeveloped young, almost look like larvae. This is especially problematic, as they can't survive outside of their mother's pouch. There's actually an aquatic opossum species in the Americas that has a waterproof pouch, but this is likely as far as they can realistically go. Then we have the placentals, which are characterized for their well-developed placentas, which promotes a longer gestation period for their young, subsequently allows the parents to give birth to them at a more advanced stage that does not require them to be held in a pouch. This unique mode of reproduction is not known to have occurred in mammals before 100 million years ago, in the mid-Cretaceous, where placentals are believed to have originated. The first fossils of placentals are even younger than that, dating to 66 million years ago or so, at the end of the Mesozoic era. Placentals were a very recent evolution in comparison, and weren't very relevant in the mammalian fauna, at their inception, even though they were the only mammals properly prepared for a fully aquatic lifestyle. But yet again, there are two modes of development in mammalian young, as said before, precociality and altriciality. Most mammals are altricial, but a few have evolved precocial habits, however most of them are herbivorous animals. This seems coherent, with a few groups of living and extinct animals that have adopted aquatic lifestyles. Manatees and dugongs are herbivorous. The extinct Desmostelians, and even the Thalassochnus, a marine sloth, explored marine environments and their closest living relatives are believed to be part of precocial mammal clades. Carnivores usually don't have the pressure to have precocial child, as they don't suffer a lot of danger. Yet there is a big problem in the ocean. For an herbivore, there is little to eat, which forces various animals from the ocean to be carnivores, or at best, omnivores. The ocean is a place to eat fish, people, not grass. This might explain why there were many ancient groups of herbivorous marine mammals, but eventually they went extinct, as the conditions for their survival were getting diminished. Cyrenians are also not very diverse either, there's just three species of manatees and one species of dugong alive today, against nearly 90 species of carnivorous cetaceans. Carnivory is the way to go if you want to live in the ocean. Seals, sea lions, walruses and sea otters are all part of the clay that includes several carnivorous mammals, so they would easily be drawn to the ocean for food. However, their young are all trichial, so they need to go on land. Also important is that their young are born at first, so they can't give birth underwater, otherwise the baby will drown. So this duality is complicated if one wants fully aquatic mammals to diversify and prosper in the ocean. Cetaceans, for some reason, were perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Early hoofed animals were hunted by predators at some point, which forced them to evolve precocial young, but then became fully herbivorous just yet, mixing meat and plant in their diets. And once they became aquatic, they saw that meat was a much better way and a more coherent diet. Manatees and dugongs have abandoned any possibility of reverting back to carnivory, as their terrestrial ancestors were fully herbivorous. Once whales eventually evolved tail first birth, they were said to dominate the oceans. Everything conspired for their success. However, as I have a personal fetish for speculative evolutionary scenarios, I think one could discuss what could exactly be the future of whales. We all know how whales have been mistreated and hunted down decades ago, to the point of near extinction for some species. Fortunately, whale hunting now is not really a huge threat. Climate change is and that is caused by us humans, no wonder. Destruction of habitats close to the shore where several species of cetaceans feed on are threatening their hunting grounds. Oceanic pollution, depletion of fish stock, destruction of breeding ground all conspire to a slow and painful death for our cetaceans. But it is the climate change and the global warming that may spell doom for several species. The increase in global temperature is at a rate that had little precedent in Earth's history. Whales have experienced severe climatic changes in the tens of millions of years they have existed on our planet, but nothing at such a dramatic and fast rate as this. The changes in climate will severely affect migration routes, as well as their preferred food stock, and at such a fast rate, several species of whales may not adapt fast enough and may die. Baleen whales will be the most affected, as they rely a lot on specific foods such as the krill, and if slight changes occur to their usual food stock, they may spell doom. After the Holocene extinction event, most, if not all, baleen whale species will die out, even the largest animal to have ever existed, the blue whale. Toothed whales will also suffer a lot from the oceanic climate change, and several species will die, 
but they are at least more versatile in their hunting grounds and in their feeding options, so at least a few species will certainly survive, like dolphins and porpoises, for instance. After all of the human turmoil occurs, the dolphins and porpoises that survive will lay a new generation of whales to the future, up until a larger extinction event ends this age of mammals and allows the inception of a brand new era for new beings to take their place. So, as you can see, evolution creates wonders. Even the biggest ones show a remarkable and intriguing background and it is impressive the amount of different overlooked requirements allows for such magnificent beasts to even exist. It's sad that many whale species might perish and tireless conservation efforts are being made to protect these extraordinary and unique animals. If the extinction of several species of whales is, however, inevitable, I hope we can enjoy the limited time we have with them. And that's it for what this video is about. So I hope you enjoyed it, keep it up, see you next, goodbye.